Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Court of Appeals for the 14th District of Texas is now in session, pursuant to adjournment. God save the Constitution and the Honorable Court. Good afternoon and welcome to the Zoom oral argument in the 14th Court of Appeals. Today we have two cases arguing. The first case is cause number 14-19-00512, Civil. Anthony Busby versus Clear Channel Outdoor and Sylvester Turner. If the uh, counsel for uh, Mr. Busby would introduce himself. Yes, Your Honor, Rafi Melkonian for Mr. Busby. And for Clear Channel Outdoor. Good afternoon, Your Honor, Brett Solberg for Clear Channel Outdoor LLC. And for Mayor Turner. Yes, my name is Derek Bauman, Your Honor, here on behalf of Mayor Turner. All right, and then our second case is 14-19-00623, Civil. And it's ZMJJDAM3 LLC and others versus Omnova Solutions, Inc. If I could have the attorney representing the appellants introduce himself. Martin Hill on behalf of the appellants, Your Honor. And for the appellee. James Schulke for Omnova Solutions. All right. We are ready to begin with our oral argument in the Busby case. Uh, Mr. Melkonian will go first and has saved five minutes for rebuttal. And then um, Mr. Bauman and Mr. Solberg are splitting their time. And we're going to uh, put the rest of you in the waiting room while the uh, person is arguing. Thank right, you, Your Honor. Oh, excuse me. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court, Rafi Melkonian for the appellant, Mr. Busby. The district court erred here by dismissing Mr. Busby's Texas Elections Code case under the TCPA. The question presented in this case, or at least the most important question, is the quantum of evidence required to survive a motion to dismiss under the TCPA, where the pleadings are the basis of the, the, the argument. What is not at issue is whether Mr. Busby's claims are correct or true. Uh, those are for discovery and trial. And I think that part of my opponent's arguments are based on their theory that Mr. Busby's claims are implausible, but that is not what is presented here. So let me start with what I think is the most important question, as I said, and that is what does the Texas, uh, the TCPA require to survive a motion to dismiss. And there, I think, the TCPA itself answers the question. 27.006 says, in determining whether a legal action should be dismissed under this chapter, the court shall consider the pleadings. Now, what does that mean? Uh, I think the cases of this court and the courts of appeals around Texas, as well as the Texas Supreme Court, have answered that question. What that means is that a case can survive on the basis of the pleadings alone if that is what the plaintiff chooses. Uh, that's what uh, the Court of Appeals said in, in Ray Serafine. I understand that case was talking about the first prong of the TCPA analysis, whether it's a TCPA claim at all, but I think it applies equally to the second prong. The, certainly the statutory text does not tell us anything else. And that is also what the Texas Supreme Court said, in my view, in In Ray Lipsky. If you look at what the court said, it says in order to survive a TCPA motion to dismiss, the plaintiff must provide enough detail to show the factual basis for his claims. The court also said it has to be more than mere notice pleading. We certainly agree with that. And the court said that the act endorses a summary process requiring judicial review of the pleadings as well as evidence. So I think the Texas courts are quite clear that the pleadings are a form of evidence for the purposes of the TCPA uh, motion to dismiss. Can, so, I you I Can I ask you a question about that quickly? Yes, Your Honor. In Lipsky, doesn't Lipsky suggest though that a non-movement must present something um, to support the allegations made in the pleading rather than just simply pointing to those allegations to survive a dismissal? Well, I, I don't think Lipsky says that directly. Uh, I don't think that was the question presented in the case. Uh, and I think that the parts of Lipsky that I just referred to suggest that you can survive a <coughs> dismiss on the pleadings alone. I will say that in most cases, I think the plaintiff is well advised 
to put in an affidavit and exhibits uh, in order to survive. Sorry, Your Honor. If, you're, if your position is correct, what's the difference between a TCPA motion and a motion to dismiss under Rule 91A? I think there's a big difference. And I think that it remains a powerful tool in the hands of defendants. And let me explain that. Uh, the way I think this ought to work is uh, the way the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit explained it in Cuba v. Pilant, which is a case that I cite in my brief. And what they say is that it's a heightened pleading standard, even a very heightened pleading standard. Um, and the way I would analogize it is to Rule 9b and the federal rules of civil procedure, which applies in fraud cases. And the court there says, or the federal courts say, what you have to do is provide the who, what, where, and why in specific detail of the allegations you're making in order to survive that kind of motion to dismiss. But, but certainly you, this court has dismissed cases where people have not presented enough evidence, even when they've pled that that a, a fact occurred. For example, in the damages situation, you can plead that you were damaged, but you still have to present evidence. Well, Your Honor, I, I have to respectfully disagree with that as a statement of the law. I don't disagree with that that has happened in other cases. But what I'm saying is that I think as a proper understanding of the text of 27006A, this court should hold that uh, pleadings, as long as they're sufficiently detailed, can satisfy the, the high standard required under the TCPA of clear and specific evidence. I think that is compelled by what the text says. But if that is true then, wouldn't you agree that an action to which the TCPA applies uh, might not be supported by any evidence at all and yet still survive dismissal. No, Your Honor, uh, but only, uh, let me explain what I'm trying to say. I think the TCBA compels the, the conclusion that the pleadings are a form of evidence for the purposes of the TCBA motion. So there is evidence in the form of the motion itself um, to survive the thing. But I agree that if what you're asking me is, can you survive a motion to dismiss without putting in any affidavit or any exhibits? The answer to that question from my perspective is yes. Probably you shouldn't do that, but, in, but I think you can do it. I have a question for you about standing and sure. procedurally where we are on the standing. What, are, are we to construe the, the TCPA motion as a motion to dismiss for lack of standing? Is this an affirmative defense by uh, Clear Channel and Turner that there's lack of standing so that they have the burden? Where, where are we on the, all of the standing discussion? Your Honor, I hadn't thought about whose burden it is with respect to the TCPA motion. I think the answer to that is that they moved to dismiss for lack of standing as part of their TCPA motion. And I haven't disputed that it's a question of the burden of proof. Uh, my only point is that we satisfy any kind of standing test uh, that would be applicable. Well, uh, when, we, when we write opinions, the first thing that we have to address is standing, if it has been independently raised. And so is that independently raised uh, or is it only raised in conjunction with the TCPA motion? I think it was only raised in conjunction with the TCPA motion, Your Honor. But nonetheless, I think you can address standing and there we have clear standing uh, under the statute as I understand it. Okay. So but, uh, what is your evidence that you presented that you were a candidate other than your pleading that you were a candidate? Well, uh, let me answer that question in two ways. We don't have any uh, evidence in the form of an affidavit or an exhibit that we are a candidate uh, other than the pleadings. I mean, I think that's where we are in terms of the evidence. But it, with respect to Section 253, 131C's requirement, I think we're well within that. We were clearly a candidate in the election. We had announced our candidacy at the time. The, uh, the lawsuit was filed. We were filing campaign finance reform uh, campaign finance forms. With okay. do, you, do you have that in your pleading that you filed a campaign finance form or have you presented any evidence to that effect in the record? There's no evidence to that effect in the record. I think you can take judicial notice that is true. It's in our brief uh, on appeal. I don't think uh, 
I'd have to look at it again, Your Honor. I'm not sure that it is in the pleading itself, um, but I would have to look at it. But I think you can take judicial notice of the fact that Mr. Busby, in a public document, official government document, had filed a um, campaign finance report. Wasn't this pleading also filed before the uh, before he could actually file as a candidate? Well, Your Honor, uh, it certainly filed before the ballot was prepared. Uh, so that is certainly true. I think he, he was filed even before he could officially put in all the documents to be a candidate as well. Uh, so, you know, that's just a matter of timing. But there's no question that he was a candidate at the time. He was announced candidate. He was uh, collecting money. And of course, you know, the course of events proves that he in fact became a candidate and became Mr. Turner's main opponent. So I don't think my friends on the other side can necessarily argue that he never was a candidate for the purposes of 253-131C. Uh, I understand their argument with respect to B, where they say he's not on the ballot yet. That's a different question. Uh, but we're not relying on 253-131B, we're relying on C, and also on 273.081, which is the injunction portion of the Texas Elections Code. Yes, let me ask you a question about the injunction claim. Do yes, you agree that that claim is now moot since the election's over? I think that would be something for the district judge on remand, but I suspect the district judge would find that that was moot. Yes, Your Honor, because there's nothing more that can be done. Uh, I will say that doesn't make the appellate case moot by any stretch of the imagination, because uh, the point here is to challenge, um, you know, the the TCPA sanctions and attorney's fees. And the Supreme Court has said that where that remains, the appellate case isn't mooted out. Uh, but I think if we went back, there would be a question about whether the injunctive claim survives and whether it would just be the damages claim that we would have. All right. Let me ask you one quick follow-up question to something you said a moment ago. You said you were relying upon... Uh, 131C and not B. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, could you explain that for me? Because that was not how I understood your uh, position below. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, 131B says that you have to be a candidate on the ballot uh, in order to bring the claim. We agree we are not a candidate on the ballot at the time we filed that lawsuit. 131C says that a, a claim that was brought in opposition to you, a violation of the Texas Election Code where uh, the violation was in opposition to you as a candidate, you can bring. And you don't have to be on the ballot for that provision. And our friends on the other side agree that that's not what it says. So we're relying on that provision, not the one that requires you to be on the ballot. Okay, did you plead then that the contribution or expenditure that you contend is a violation of the election code was in opposition to Mr. Busby? Yes, we did, Your Honor. It's in footnote 13 of this first amended complaint. It says that Mr. Busby, excuse me, Mr. Turner entered into the scheme in order to defeat Mr. Busby in particular, rather than just to boost his own prospects. Okay, thank you. I see my time is up. I'll reserve whatever I have left. Thank you. I believe we'll hear from Mr. Uh, Bauman next. You're on mute. mute. Thank you. I apologize. All May right. I please? There we go. We got our timer. Okay. Sure. May it please the court. Um, I'm happy to ask, go straight into questions if you guys have any, but I can, I, otherwise I can just begin on what the petition counts as evidence. Um, I mean, I think there was an important concession just made at the end that they're saying they were not relying on 253.131B, but we're relying on C. Um, I think that doesn't help them because if we were, if the court is to construe it, the phrase in opposition to a candidate just to mean anything that might possibly hurt them or perhaps some scienter element, which doesn't appear in the statute. I mean, I think that would be a rather broad construction of that and kind of open up a hole so wide that you would never really need sub B to be in, and the requirements to be on the ballot. Um, do you, you agree, sir, that uh, Mr. Busby was a candidate under the election code when the suit was filed? 
I agree he was a candidate. I do not agree that he was a candidate on the ballot. I guess that's no longer an issue that we're fighting about anymore. But yes, I do not dispute that he was a candidate, even though his name was not appearing on the ballot. Um, but to go specifically to the petition as evidence, I mean, I think the point of this is the TCPA is meant to weed out the unmeritorious claims and, and that the two fifty the 27.005 specifically says both the requirement that there be prima facie evidence um, and I mean evidence and then the prima facie elements of a claim and those are both well understood standards under Texas law and the legislature knew that when they passed this. Um, it has long been true in Texas law that an evident that, uh, that a petition is not evidence even if verified and if the legislature had meant to make this set of statutes, something other than that, they would have had to take, I think, a little bit more clear language than just considering the petition as that they have in the language that they're trying to rely on now. Well, we're um, certainly allowed to consider it as evidence for the movement in terms of what claims are being made. Right, but that's, the Supreme Court has actually clarified that. I mean, the, it is evidence in that very limited sense of you only know what the claims are by looking at the petition. And so, yes, the TCPA did discuss the, the uh, movement's burden as an evidentiary burden, but the Supreme Court has clarified the only thing that means is you, what are the pleadings? And there's also the case from the first court of appeals, the name escapes me right now, but Justice Brown had wrote that if, if it is not clear from the allegations in the petition that the movement can present evidence to say, look, even though it's not clear, this is based on my right of association or my right of petition or my right of free speech. So there, the, certainly the, it's, it's not limited to just the petition on the movement's burden, um, but if the petition itself makes it clear that it fits within those uh, enumerated rights, then that's all the plaintiff really has to rely on. Um, and the Supreme Court has made clear that that's true. Uh, but the, the burden for the, the uh, plaintiff when it moves to them is much more specific. It talks specifically about prima facie, the prima facie case and, and clear and convincing evidence. Um, and if we take the petition as just something that would satisfy that burden, then as was mentioned, this really is nothing more than a 91A motion. Um, and so it is also, it doesn't, they're also, like was mentioned before, it's entirely possible that someone could allege all that they wanted to have zero evidence to actually support it, and that would still somehow survive the TCPA motion. Um, there was also the question raised of standing. I don't know, Chris, Judge Christopher, if you want to address it as well, but there was, I, I don't know that there is necessarily a distinction between whether this was independently raised or if this was raised as a ground for the, uh, motion itself, but I mean, I think standing is squarely before this court. Um, I mean, I, I, yes, we did argue it as this is the court can't, must grant the TCBA motion because there is no standing, um, but I think that's a valid ground to present that on, uh, the TCBA motion on, and the Who, Whose statute, burden is it at that point? I'm sorry? If it's in connection with the TCBA, is the burden on you? Is it an affirmative defense where the burden is on you to present that case? Well, I would say, even if it is, I don't, because the standing must be proven when they come in the door and it's the plaintiff's burden. You can argue since, I mean, anytime a defendant makes a motion, like a motion for summary judgment, they still have a burden. I'm willing to accept that I had some burden to show that this was true, um, just to basically show, well, actually I would say it was our burden on the TCPA to just show that our claim fell, fell within the TCPA. If we treat this just as one of the grounds that we were saying that they can't prove, then it's their burden. But I think I could even go further if the court wanted to say, look, I took that Mayor Turner took on this burden to show that it's true, we met that. Because the argument we were making at the trial court, which again, doesn't seem to be as, as hot of an issue now, is that he was not a candidate on the ballot. And we showed that he was not. We showed by the time of this, the rules and when uh, he could become a candidate on the ballot, we proved that he was not. Um, our position was not. Let me ask you a question about that. Real quick. Yes. Uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but. No, please. If, if now uh, Mr. Busby is acknowledging that the issue about whether his name was on the ballot is no longer an issue and he's relying upon 
Section 131C. And if you agree that, in fact, Mr. Busby was a candidate for mayor at the time the lawsuit was filed, then in what way was his petition deficient in alleging jurisdictional facts? Uh, I don't know at that point that it's jurisdictional. I think under even under C, he has to show that he, this was a campaign event in in contra in in opposition to him. And so, is that a jurisdictional fact? Is that just what if his part of his burden of getting in the door? I, I, you, I guess you could go either way, but he still has not shown, even if it's a standing issue or not, he has not shown that what his allegations are. Even let alone proof of what those allegations are, he has not shown that what his allegations are were in opposition to him, other than just saying, I think that that's true. Um, so he still hasn't gotten in the door by going to see. He just, I guess, perhaps takes away some of the standing issues, um, but he still has the same burden. And if I could just, in the minute I have left, unless you have questions, I'm happy to answer, but the minute I have left, I, I briefed this, but I want to touch on even if we were to go so far as to treat this petition as evidence, he still has not identified a claim because 253.131 talks about damages, as he says. And he says now on appeal that 253.03 is what's against the, the violation of the mayor, but the 253.03 just says a violation of this chapter. So we still are no closer to understanding what violation has occurred. Um, and so even now on appeal, we still have no description of that, no understanding of that, and what we are, what we are supposed, the violation we were supposed to have occurred. It, to this date, that has still not been shown. Um, Could you briefly address the, um, whether that the uh, injunction issue is moot? I, I believe it was from the day we walked into that hearing. Um, I mean, there maybe there's a question on, could it have happened again? But clearly at this point now, it cannot. It cannot happen again. And so, but um, I think Mr. Milconian is right. It was like, we are sort of judging this mootness standard based on what was happening before the trial court at the time. Um, but before the trial court at the time, everybody acknowledged that these billboards were down. Um, and so there was nothing to enjoin anymore. Um, and so I think even if we are looking strictly at what was before the trial court, it was moot from the day we walked into that hearing. Do we know from the record uh, when the billboards were taken down? No, I, I don't have the specific date in front of me. And I'm not, it's not in the record and I, I don't know personally either, but it was, it was understood and agreed that by the time of the hearing that they were no longer up. I don't know, if, I don't know if it was agreed, but I think Clear Channel said they were down. Well, nobody, I, I suppose I should, you're right and I should clarify, nobody has opposed that or disagreed with that statement. Um, there's been no dispute over whether they're down. What about the fact that uh, they're still responding to attorney's fees? So we still have to decide that point. I mean- The mootness point. Well, the, the mootness is whether is, okay. So the mootness ties to whether they can prevail on their claim, but a TCPA is something that we get. We, it's, so let's say we'd file a TCPA motion and they non-suited, we still get the TCPA motion, right? Um, that's still an, a claim for affirmative relief. So even if, it was moot before, that's true, but even if they had non-suited and tried to moot it by the non-suit, we would still have the TCPA motion and the attorney's fees are under the TCPA motion. So the fact that their claim was moot doesn't change the fact that we were allowed to recover attorney's fees under our motion. If there are no further questions, I will cede the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Now we will hear from Mr. Solberg. It please the court, your honors. I'm uh, happy to take questions if you have them or, or jump in whichever you'd prefer. Um, I, I think what I'd like to talk about, if I may, your honor, is uh, this issue of can Mr. Busby stand on his pleadings under 27006A to survive um, the TCPA motion? I, I think if you look at the text of 27006, a, it says the court shall consider the pleadings. Okay, that's fine. So does 166A, Rule of Civil Procedure 166A, the common summary judgment standard we're all familiar with. It says the court must consider the pleadings, admissions, affidavits, stipulations of parties. It's no different here. It doesn't say that the court shall consider the pleadings as evidence. Now, 
Mr. Busby in his reply brief did identify for the first time in any court uh, a couple of cases, and we found some more that Mr. Bauman briefed to this court last week in a letter that in which some courts have said that the Supreme Court and, and, and this statute require considering plaintiff's pleading as evidence. And they cite to um, basically two Supreme Court cases. One of them is the Inre Lipsky case that Mr. Malconian talked about before, and specifically on page 590 of Inre Lipsky. But that's not what Inre Lipsky says. Inre Lipsky said, doesn't say that you consider the pleadings as evidence. It doesn't say that fair notice is enough. What Inre Lipsky decided was whether or not clear and specific evidence could uh, include the types of evidence that we're all familiar with that can support a summary judgment motion or a jury verdict. That is circumstantial evidence and indirect evidence, because there was a split among the courts of appeals of whether or not those types of evidence were permitted as uh, under this standard of clear and specific. Now the court said specifically addressing a defamation claim in that case, that the fair notice standard in the, in this uh, in this instance likely wouldn't give enough uh, detail, but it never said that having enough detail was enough to survive a TCPA motion to dismiss. What it said is, yes, there is a heightened pleading standard in some of these cases, but that isn't what the TCPA is all about. The TCPA is, a, is an evidentiary standard. It's designed to make the, uh, make the plaintiff come to court early and show a prima facie case. And we know that's what N. Ray Lipsky uh, meant because it's what it did in that case. It actually uh, uh, reversed because the affidavit that plaintiff presented on damages was insufficient because it was conclusory. So that's sort of one line of these cases that relies on Lipsky, which is what Mr. Malconian was talking about earlier. The other is the Hirsch v. Tatum line of cases. And Hirsch v. Tatum is uh, a case that decided the step one inquiry, i.e. what sort of evidence does a movement in a TCPA motion need to present to, to show that, um, that, that uh, plaintiff's pleadings fall within the TCPA. And the court in that case said, pointing to 27006A, said uh, that in determining whether legal action should be dismissed, the court shall consider the pleadings as well as affidavits. Right. So what the court said is, as we have often observed, the plaintiff's petition is the best and all sufficient evidence of the nature of the action. So to the extent that the plaintiff's petition is anything, is evidence of anything, it's evidence of what plaintiff is alleging and nothing more. And some courts have taken this out of context and applied it to the step two inquiry, which is the, the uh, sufficiency, the, the prima facie evidence that the non-movement has to present. As Mr. Bauman said, uh, the legislature, I mean, these concepts of evidence and more specifically prima facie evidence, I just for the fun of it looked them up in Blacks to see what Blacks had to say about them. They're hundreds of years old, your honors. Um, certainly the court or the legislature, if they wanted to, they can define something as, as, you know, they can call day night if they want to. In this case, they didn't do that. They simply mirroring, mirroring the 166A standard we're also familiar with said, look, you have to consider the pleadings um, when you're determining whether or not to dismiss this case. That makes sense. How else do you know what the case is alleging? Um, on the issue of, of the TCPA motion standing, I agree with Mr. Bauman. We addressed standing in the context of uh, grounds for dismissal on TCPA. We did not address it in a plea to the jurisdiction or an independent basis. It was uh, therefore incumbent on Mr. Busby to come to court to prove that he had standing to file his lawsuit in the first place. Well, let me ask you a question about that. Um, so if the issue, uh, if, if, we're not, if we don't have an issue anymore about whether or not he, his name appeared on the ballot, do you also agree that Mr. Busby was a candidate for mayor when he filed the suit? Yes, Your Honor, we agree as well that he was a candidate. Um, we do not agree that his pleadings, even if they're evidence, are sufficient to have alleged that he was 
deliberately harmed because Section C requires um, a contribution or expenditure in opposition to a candidate specifically. Okay. And there is no allegation that Mr. Uh, Turner and Clear Channel, to the extent they did any of the crazy things that Mr. Busby alleges, did them directly in opposition to Mr. Busby. And isn't that pleading defect a curable one? On amendment, it would be. However, once the hearing on the TCPA motion has commenced, Mr. Busby no longer is able to amend his pleading. Um, well, I know he filed an amended petition once. He did, correct. And um, at least, uh, uh, but the standing issue though, wasn't raised until the hearing. And then it wasn't briefed until the supplemental briefing after the hearing. So wouldn't he be entitled to amend then in response to that argument? Uh, perhaps, Your Honor, I would have to look at the record. I, I didn't recall that specifically, but if, if that were the case, then he likely would. Um, the, I think the trial court would have discretion to allow him to amend in that case. Okay. And what are we to take by the fact that the trial court dismissed the case without prejudice? which is not how you normally dismiss under the TCPA. Yes, that's, that's correct, Your Honor. Um, that sounds more like a standing dismissal. That is the way we interpreted it as well, Your Honor. But in this case, because no evidence was presented as to any of the elements of any of the claims Mr. Busby made, if this court believes that there is standing now, the court can still affirm the trial court uh, based on the fact that Mr. Busby failed to meet his burden under the TCPA. Barring any further questions, I thank the court for your time. Thank you. All right, we'll have rebuttal now. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, let me address a couple of those questions that came up during uh, my friends on the other side argument. First of all, I think something that was just said that there was no allegation that these uh, election code violations were against Mr. Busby in the petition is incorrect. As I said in my opening argument, there is a direct allegation that the, uh, these particular billboards were placed in opposition to Mr. Busby and not just to help Mr. Turner. And that is on page 54 of the clerk's record. So I agree that we could have gotten uh, a chance to replead that as well if we wanted, but I don't think we need to. I think it's directly in the record. Let me address the question Justice Christopher raised about um, the burden of proof and uh, with respect to standing. I think the answer, now that I've thought about it for a few minutes, is that there's a difference between constitutional standing and a remedy. And with respect to constitutional standing, that is something the court has to assure itself of its own jurisdiction. But on that point, we clearly have constitutional standing. Uh, this statute, the Texas Election Code, extends its reach to anyone aggrieved. I think that's the statutory language. And what the Texas Supreme Court said in Android is that that requires a particularized grievance rather than, you know, a generalized grievance as a voter. And I think we clearly get to that. Uh, Mr. Busby uh, was a candidate in this election. Now my friends on the other side have conceded that, both of them. So there's no question about constitutional standing. What's left is the remedy question. Do we have a valid remedy under the Texas Elections Code? And there, I think we probably have that burden to, to plead that, but I think we've plainly reached that under both the injunction provision, uh, which I know we have a debate about whether that is moot or not, or you know what it does to the appeal, but also under this other provision, 253-131C. So I, I think uh, we reach both of them easily, but uh, I think there's a distinction between constitutional standing and a remedy. Uh, let me address one more point, which is that, and we haven't talked about it yet, but I do want to just say that we had a right uh, and we asked for discovery with respect to th this case under 27006B. And what that provision says is that you get discovery for good cause and the discovery has to be specific and limited. And I would submit that's exactly what we asked for. We asked for two depositions and some document discovery. And so to the extent 
this court believes that you have to plead with documents uh, and an affidavit, even though I disagree with that. I don't think that's what this text says, and I might come back to that in a second. But if the court believes that, I think that puts pressure on this on 27006B and makes this court at least consider what does good cause mean with respect to these kind of claims. And as far as I know, I don't think any Texas Court of Appeals has really gotten into the details of how you decide good cause with respect to the discovery provision of the TCPA. So with respect to that, I think I just want to offer the court two signposts uh, that may uh, help you if you were going to reach that question. And the first is that uh, the INRE SSCD case, I think it is, it's cited in my brief, says that where the defendants have all the documents, if you can plead enough, uh, if you can show that you know they have documents that you don't have, and you can get them in a specific and limited way, that's good cause for the purposes of discovery. So I agree with that, and I think that would be one way for this court to uh, structure it. The other is a case I just found last night. It's called Hughes from the first court. It's 579 Southwest 3rd, 672. It's not a holding. I don't want to be clear about that. But the court says in passing that the burden for discovery under uh, the TCPA should be lower than the burden for pre-suit uh, pre discovery under Rule 202. And I think that's another way for this court to approach that question and to answer it in its opinion. Uh, so to the extent you disagree with me on the pleading, I would say that then uh, you need to answer the question with respect to discovery. Uh, let me just use my remaining time to address the question about the pleading standard again one more time. Uh, my friends on the other side keep saying the statute means one thing with respect to whether the TCPA applies at all, but then suddenly when it, uh, you're talking about the motion to dismiss, the statutory text, which is exactly the same, means something else. I don't think that's true. I think the court, the legislature intended to put pleadings as evidence for both cases, and that's what this court should hold. I see my time is up, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, interesting arguments. The case of Busby versus Clear Channel Outdoor and Sylvester Turner is submitted to the court. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be ready for our second argument. Thank you, Honor. This is Martin Hill uh, for the appellants. Uh, is my screen supposed to come up? Okay. Yes, it should. Just now wait. Says start my video. Wait just a minute. There we go. There we are. Okay. Well, oh. Maybe I'm supposed to start without the video. Uh, <laughs> thank nope. you, Honor. May it, may it please the court. Uh, the appellants in this case are a small family business and their owners, Manu Shapur and his wife, Zora Shapur. There are several defendants, but they're all companies uh, that were owned by the Shapurs. They owned uh, trademarks. They owned a patent. Uh, they owned a manufacturing facility with land and buildings for making or for blending the drilling fluids because their business was the business of selling drilling fluids to uh, distributors who in turn would sell those drilling fluids uh, to end users, to the people who were actually drilling oil and gas uh, wells. And I, I point that out because uh, people don't buy drilling fluid just uh, because it, it looks good in their lawn. They buy it based on what they think their, their needs are for their customers who need the drilling fluid. So it's a constant up and down battle and totally tied. The actual sales are totally tied to the uh, perceived demand uh, for drilling. Uh, and <clears throat> while we're under currently an oil and gas um, uh, problem, I guess we'd say uh, here in Texas and actually across the world, uh, they were also in 2015 at right about the time that this sale uh, happened. They sold uh, their business, my clients, the appellants, uh, to Omnova. Omnova is a publicly traded New York Stock Exchange listed company out of Ohio. Uh, on the evening of June the 3rd, 2015, under a closing package, it was not just one uh, contract. It was an asset purchase agreement that had all of the disclosures separately identifying each and every uh, listed asset or disclosure of liabilities, whatever it is that Omnova requested was provided in that 272 uh, page uh, package. Uh, 
At the time, they were they sold the business uh, for uh, five million dollars, a short, a little bit less than that. Although they had debts to pay out of that, uh, plus they were supposed to get 1.5 million as a holdback once uh, the acquisition had been completed after two years. The trial court in this case uh, awarded uh, five and a half million dollars against my clients. So this couple who was trying to retire, according to even plaint uh, plaintiffs. VM Novas uh, lost, not only did they lose their company, they lost more money than they got for their company. And yet the plaintiffs on Nova were able under the judge, trial court's judgment uh, to keep all of those assets, the trademarks, the patent, the land, the buildings, the operating facilities, manufacturing facilities. They, they closed the documents, this 272 page asset purchase agreement on June, on the evening of June the 3rd, 2015, the very next morning, on Nova's accounting people arrived and uh, looked at the QuickBooks and said, oh, there's some sales that we thought were going to occur that didn't. Uh, a conflict occurred. Mr. Shapur, my client, uh, offered to unwind the transaction. If you're not happy, I'll take my company back. Uh, Nova refused to, refused to mitigate by unwinding the transaction, proceeded to hold on to it, fired him, uh, and then I uh, brought this case. Now, internal documents that we uh, discovered uh, throughout this case, Defendant's Exhibit 16, and referred to again in Defendant's Exhibit 80, was an internal document from the Chief Financial Officer of Omnova, Paul DeSantis, which said, quote, no acquisition is perfect. Let's not get too hung up on the numbers for May. The assets are worth practically the value of the acquisition. Now, this is just shortly uh, before the closing, within hours or the same day or the day before. Did Omnova like the business? Did they want to proceed? Yes, they did. Omnova's 8K public SEC filing dated August 11th, 2015, which is Defendant's Exhibit 31, more than two months after the sale, reported to their shareholders and to the world that might look at SEC filings, quote, New blending lab and warehouse facility in Houston, Texas, USA, under their acquisitions, strategic acquisitions. And they said, with room to expand close to the customer base, avoid future capital expenditure, and get this, Omnova says to the world and to their shareholders, and it quote, an example of the strategic acquisitions we want to make. So even after the closing, Omnova wanted the business. They didn't want to unwind it. They didn't want to mitigate their damages. They wanted to proceed and they didn't want to get hung up with the numbers. Why well, unwind? Me, let's, if you let's assume that we just accept that argument. And, uh, and so that's an issue of damages. Under your pleadings for rendition, what theory do we, do we change the, uh, the, the judgment and send it back? Under what theory do we render under uh, two basic theories, or, or yeah, we'll say two because the first one is the damages. The, the second two are, there was not a fraudulent inducement here because the trial court ignored the law of Mercedes and of JP Morgan Chase, ORCA, uh, which provided uh, that you can't stick your head in the sand if there are red flags or if the document itself contradicts what you say you believe then there should be absolutely uh, no damages because there is no fraudulent inducement. Secondly, the, the judgment was for breach of contract. The, the judgment, the, well, the judgment was for both, but the, they ultimately chose to rely on the breach of contract when they went uh, to, the, uh, to the final judgment. But the findings okay. of fact- So the uh, question are, is, how would we render a judgment that there was no breach of contract as a matter of law? Oh As a goodness. matter of law, there is a misunderstanding. The case. There is a, a misrepresentation that occurred at the trial court and that has occurred uh, in this Ooh. court by the Everyone plaintiffs on NOVA frozen. in describing what the contract required. You can't breach a contract if you didn't do something in violation of the contract. What the uh, what NOVA has said and pled to this court, if you look at page 39 of their brief, there's a term that goes throughout the entire contract, and that term says a seller material adverse effect. That is a defined term. It's capitalized and it's emboldened as well. Okay. Mr. Things Hill. are going on with the screen, Mr. but. Mr. Hill, I, I hate to interrupt you, but 
I was frozen out of like the last three minutes, I think, of that <laughs> As was uh, I. discussion. As was I. Do I get the a other judges minutes? frozen also? They appear to look frozen. You're frozen again. Can you hear me? Yeah, and now Mr. Hill is frozen. Okay. Justice Jewell is frozen. Okay. All right. I'm back. Okay. I'm back. Sorry about that. Although no, I don't think I, it, it says our internet connection is unstable is the is the message okay. that I'm getting. <laughs> so uh, skipping the fraudulent inducement under the Mercedes-Benz case and all that and jumping to the material breach of contract, in order to have a breach of contract, there has to be a material breach of contract. The trial, excuse me, Omnova in the trial court and again in this court, you just left the screen. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? I can now. Okay. All in right. the trial court, as well as the no. court. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill. Hold on for a minute. We are having Harris County building issues. As yeah, that's the problem. Um, we need you to like back up about two or three minutes, I think, because I don't know, at least I know I didn't hear you. The last thing I heard from you, Justice Christopher, before we had our issues was I think you were asking a question on Mercedes. All right. Uh, right. Judge Jewell, are you still there? You look frozen now. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, what, I, what I asked was, in connection with the breach of contract, you've asked for rendition. How would we render that there was no breach of contract as a matter of law? Because the Omnova in the trial court, and again to this court, misrepresented the contractual term that this court can read by looking at the contract itself that defines the term seller material adverse effect. If you look at page 39 of Omnova's brief, they have misled this court as they did the trial court by saying, quote, seller material adverse effect. They put quote marks around it, they capitalize the S, the M, the A and the E. Seller material adverse effect is defined in the APA as a material adverse effect on the consolidated assets, liabilities, financial condition, or results of operations of the sellers, the conduct of the business, or the ownership of purchased assets, close quotes. That is what they said in the trial court. That is what the trial court held without looking at the first part of the definition that is in the sentence. And if you actually look at plaintiff's exhibit 40, which is the asset purchase agreement, and you look at the definition of seller material adverse effect it is a complete mis misapplication of the duty, whether it be fraud or material misrepresentation of the contract to say that all of these various failures to disclose a drop in sales in May and June or forecast sales are a breach of the seller material adverse effect. And the reason is if you read section APA, section 5.01, uh, which is uh, in the uh, plaintiff's uh, 40, we have it several places actually the same, it's the asset purchase agreement. It's the basic document, right? Under 501, that title is organization, good standing and qualification. So we're talking about the corporate structure. We're not talking about the industry. Now, you can say, well, the document also says if you've got a provision in one section, you can't limit it to that section, but it certainly notifies you we're talking about the organization as a structure. Then within it, the actual language says, this is actually from the contract itself, which is contrary to what the trial court uh, interpreted it to be. Each seller company is a corporation or limited liability company, duly organized, validly existing, and in good standing under the laws of the state of Texas. The sellers are duly qualified to do business and are in good standing in each and every jurisdiction where it is required to so qualify and where the failure to qualify or to be in good standing would have a material adverse effect on the consolidated assets, liabilities, financial condition or results of operations of the sellers, the conduct of business or the ownership of the purchase assets define with parentheses a quote, seller material adverse effect. That was in bold with capitals. It is a defined term under section 5.01 of the APA, which is per exhibit 40 of the brief. They misrepresented that this provision applies 
outside the company's ability to conduct business. There is absolutely no evidence in this breach of contract case that the sellers did not have a proper organization, that they didn't own the patent, that they didn't own the assets, and that they weren't able to function as a company in each and every jurisdiction. That's what 5.01 talks about. That's what the definition of seller material adverse effect is. Instead, Omnova and the trial court, just as they did in page 39 of the brief before this court, misrepresented by taking only a portion. They skipped the whole part as to what is it that's the conduct that could then cause the material adverse effect. And under 5.01, that is very clearly uh, the capacity of the company uh, to engage in business. There is no evidence that the company couldn't engage in the business. In fact, it did engage in the business. The evidence was that they point to is that there was a dip in sales. This is a market condition by oil and gas companies wanting or not wanting a certain amount of drilling fluids. That's yeah, I a think, forecast. I think, we're, I think we're very familiar with the uh, oil market going up and down and the fluctuations as was uh, Obnova in uh, watching the drill count. If I could, let me focus your attention now on the alternative, which is the fraud allegations. Uh, how is there uh, not a scintilla of evidence of fraud? Assuming the contract arguments that you've made are persuasive, um, how do we not, how do we get around the fraud element, number one? And I well, do have a follow up to that uh, when you're through with that. I think in the first instance, the fraud, uh, you have to decide, decide what is the legal standard. And it's our contention that the legal standard should be the, the uh, announcement in Mercedes quoting uh, Chase, Orca, Assets, uh, both Supreme Court cases, that quote, in determining whether justifiable reliance, it has to be justifiable reliance, is negated as a matter of law. Courts must consider the nature of the party's relationship in the contract. Look to a 272-page completely consolidated APA with all the disclosure schedules. Look at it for a complete integration clause, section 8.04. Look at it as a complete document. Look at the fact that we have a seven-employee seller to a multinational publicly traded company. Is, is, there, a, and, is there a, in your APA, is there actually the statement that we are not relying on each other's representations? Do we see an sec, a disclaimer in your APA? Section 8.04 of the APA is a total integration clause, but it does not, unfortunately, say uh, no reliance. However, that doesn't change the standard as announced in both Carduca or Mercedes-Benz and Orca that you look to the parties, you look to their experience, they can't bury their head in the sand, you look to red flags, you look to whether they cannot blindly rely on defendant's reputation, representations, or conduct where plaintiff's knowledge, experience, or background warrant investigation. When you have, as Omnova did, a general counsel who was communicating directly, by the way, with my client, not through counsel who'd been set up. Jones Day was representing the buyer, Omnova. Mr. Rohrbach was representing my client. Instead, the general counsel of Omnova went directly uh, to my client to try to get certain uh, information that they then tried to rely on. But if you look at the red flags and you look at that legal standard announced in Mercedes, you come up with a very clear statement that they couldn't possibly have relied on this. In the first instance, the in the asset purchase agreement itself and the schedule attached to that, they want to know there's a request or requirement. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. I, but I think right. I lost I'll, time. I'll, I'll reserve my follow-up question for, for your rebuttal. I, did I lose time, though, during the computer thing? I, think I don't we think gave, so. I think we gave it back to you, but uh, you can have one minute to wrap up this okay. train of thought. Under 1.02D, assume purchase orders, it says none meaning that the representation at closing was there are no purchase orders whatsoever. Omnova asked for additional uh, documents showing what, what sales are out there. We thought there were some more sales. On the day, on just before the closing, Mr. Rohrbeck, as counsel for my clients, wrote an email 
to Jones Day, the Buyers Council, that said, as Defendants Exhibit 25, it's a clear disclaimer of reliance. In a detailed and somewhat salty conversation with our client, I was strongly told that New Fluids has no, and he capitalized N-O, pending purchase orders. A number of inquiries have been received totaling several hundred thousand dollars, but as of this minute, none have become purchase orders. If that changes in the next hour and a half, next two and a half hours, the schedule will be updated. Since we have only inquiries, not orders, follow up on those inquiries on setting prices, delivery date, and other matters will be solely within the buyer's discretion. That is a clear announcement of disclaimer. Don't rely on anything other than the APA. All right, thank you. We'll hear more on rebuttal. May it please the court, James Schulke for Omnova Solutions. Uh, if I could, I just wanted to start by uh, addressing the uh, accusation that we've in some way attempted to make a misrepresentation to this court or to the trial court. And I'd like the, the record to reflect that our brief links to the actual page in the record on which the entire section that Mr. Hill is referring to appears. And so absolutely no uh, effort to misrepresent the contents of the agreement, which of course were aired repeatedly in the trial court. There was no uh, ability or effort to conceal from the trial court judge who sat through a week long bench trial in which Mr. Hill participated uh, Certainly no, no effort, no ability to uh, misrepresent the contents of an exhibit that was on both sides exhibit lists um, admitted into evidence. And we think that, frankly, the, uh, the plain language of Section 5.01 is very clear. The definition of material adverse effect is not limited to good standing uh, or the right to conduct business. And I think that uh, even just reading section 5.01, the plain meaning is apparent, but you can also look to the other places throughout the reps and warranties where the defined term mater seller material adverse effect is used. I think that uh, if you thought that seller material adverse effect as a defined term was limited only to the content of the representation made in section 5.01, that those other sections would become meaningless or at best uh, surplusage. And so both the plain language of 5.01 and the use of the defined term throughout the agreement, I think um, make it apparent the, uh, the meaning of that defined term. Um, I'd like to just take a second to uh, back up and to try to address um, the, the Carduco argument that um, the appellants have relied on kind of principally as their first argument in their briefs and that Mr. Hill touched on a moment ago, um, just by framing the relationship between the fraud and breach of contract claims, which of course, uh, Omnova did bring both a fraud case and a breach of contract case, um, as your honors are aware. The, the breach of contract case is based on representations that were made in black and white in the terms of the asset pur purchase agreement, including the representation found in section 5.20 that there's been no material adverse effect, referring back to the definition from 5.01. But similarly, there is a representation in 5.12. There are actually two different, in the last section of 5.12, there are two different uh, representations. One, that there has been no change in the financial condition of the sellers since the financial statement date. And the financial statement date is actually as of the end of the prior year, 2014. So this deal closed in early June of 2015. And so the representation was made there in the contract in black and white, no change in financial 
condition of the company since the end of 2014 and no seller material adverse effect or as a result of closing buyer material adverse effect. And again, with a reference to uh, the intervening period since the financial statement date, that's section 5.12. 5.20, no material adverse effect. There are also other representations made that have been addressed in the briefs about not having lost any major customers or have, having any major customers materially reduce their business. And none of those claims, um, the, the representations are made in the contract, none of those claims depend on representations made prior to the contract um, and the evidence to prove that those representations were breached are just, it's just the evidence of what the real facts were at the time that the company was acquired. And so that's what's the actual state of the business, the current state of the customers, the current state of sales and revenues. And those things certainly had declined materially since the financial statement date and so that's referred to in section 5.12. Appellant's own expert, a Mr. Chernow, who testified at trial, agreed with us that a significant decline in sales constitutes a material reduction in results of operations, which is part of the definition of a material adverse effect a decline in results of operations is one of the things that can qualify as a material adverse effect, along with a change in financial condition and some other things. Uh, Mr. Chernow agreed that results of operations constituted an MAE. He also agreed, although he attempted to disagree, he was impeached with his deposition testimony. He also agreed that a significant decline in sales constituted a change in financial condition, which is an independent rep outside the definition, the defined term MAE, material adverse effect, and financial condition is not a defined term, but, but their own expert had conceded that a significant decline in sales, which is an undisputed fact that there was a significant decline in sales, that that constituted a change in financial condition. And so we think it's very clear the basis of the breach of contract claim. It's what's represented in the contract. And then it's the evidence of breach. It's just the evidence of what the reality was. And that evidence really was not disputed either. What the true sales were uh, as of the time that Omnova acquired the business. And there had been a series of misrepresentations made leading up to the closing outside the contract, absolutely, in the contract as well. So the fraud claim rests on both. The fraud, the fraud claim is based both on intentional represent, misrepresentations made outside the contract for the entire month leading up to the closing. The first material misrepresentation identified by the evidence and then found by the trial court was early within the first week of May. And there was a string of misrepresentations, starting with a representation in the first week of May that, um, the, that Mr. Sharpour, the day-to-day -day manager of the company, was already representing, we booked $344,000 of sales, which turned out even at the end of the month, they had done less than a third of that. And so it continued. The, the fraud claim rests on both sets of misrepresentations, the breach of contract claim just re rests on the misrepresentation actually in the agreement. And so when you look at how the case law applies to this set of facts, the Carduco case, I think as uh, you pointed out, Justice Christopher, that Carduco by its terms can't apply to a breach of contract case. The holding of Carduco is that you can't rely on extra contractual promises that are directly contradicted by the agreement. And so if what you're talking about is a breach of the agreement, of course, there was no breach claim in Car there was no breach of contract claim in Carduco, because what the conduct that 
the plaintiff was complaining about was expressly permitted by the contract. That was the entire issue in the case. Um, so Carduco, uh, absolutely no application to the breach contract case. It's also not applicable to this fraud case because unlike in Carduco, well, let me ask you, let me ask a question real quick on the, absolutely. under either the contract case, but specifically under the fraud claims, how do we get vicarious liability against Mrs. Shakur uh, individually? Was there any evidence that she participated in or even knew about this fraud? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. So, um, yes, Mrs. Sharpour, and if I mispronounce her name, uh, Zora Sharpour, I believe, was the principal of each of the three entities that sold these assets. She was the loan signatory to this agreement on behalf of the entities, and she was also the sole owner of two of them and the primary owner of the third. So she is the owner and the executive, either the president or the managing member of all three entities. And so and if you look at the what the agreement says about this, there's a definition of what seller's knowledge mean means, and it includes her individually. And so okay, that's I think in the contract in the contract claim, right? Well, I think it, I think that's evidence that goes toward whether she's part of the seller group that has knowledge of the operations of the company. It's true that Mrs. Uh, Sharpour did not testify at trial, so we don't have direct evidence of her state of mind from her own testimony. Absolutely the case. I do think that the standard here is for a fraudulent inducement claim, evidence of breach plus even slight circumstantial evidence of fraud is enough to uh, have a fraud claim. And so I think there's far more than slight circumstantial evidence here that uh, Mrs. Sharpour had knowledge of what was going on with the company by being the executive responsible for running the company, the owner of the company. So she's going to have knowledge of whether there's a precipitous de decline in the revenues from the company those revenues are hitting her bank account. She's the owner. If it were the case, which we don't believe is the case, but if it were the case that appellant's position, which they uh, alleged in their, in their brief on appeal, was that she was totally ignorant of what was going on with the business, she still is liable for fraud because she has made the false representations that are in the APA and again, that's part of the foundation of the fraud claim. And she has made those misrepresentations with recklessness as to their truth, made as a positive assertion um, with no knowledge of their truth. That's, that's reckless fraud. And so I, I think liability still attaches there, even if you sort of buy the, well, she was just the wife, um, so she wasn't involved. But the reality is that she was not just the wife. She actually was the owner and and uh, president of the company. Um, and so, but absolutely understand the question. Cause she was not there. She was, she was the only principal, the only signer of the agreement and kind of principal that did not, uh, testify in the trial. Thank you. <clears throat> there, there are a number of things that, um, I could address, but one of the things that um, maybe quickly Mr. Hill touched on in his argument um, was kind of an evidentiary issue of, well, there was this email from the chief financial officer, that's Paul DeSantis, where it said, um, let's not get too hung up on the numbers for May. And I'd invite the court to go look at that whole document. It's Plaintiff's Exhibit 34. It's one of our exhibits. Mr. DeSantis is responding to an email from Mr. LeMay. Mr. LeMay was the executive level individual actually responsible for doing this deal. Mr. DeSantis, no question about it, he's the CFO, so he's part of the executive team, but he's at least one step removed from Mr. LeMay and Mr. Chapel, who testified at trial. Um, 
but he's resp- Mr. DeSantis is responding to an email in which Mr. LeMay is relaying the information received from the appellants, Mr. Sharpour. And Mr. LeMay characterizes that information, which we now know to be untrue. He characterizes it as trending improvement, but not all we hoped for. And so it's that that Mr. DeSantis is responding to when he says, let's not get too hung up on it. What he's talking about is the difference between what was represented and what was hoped for, as opposed to what was represented and what reality was. And Mr. DeSantis also testified at trial by deposition. And you can go look at his deposition testimony in the record. He addresses this issue. And I think it's uh, enlightening as to what was going on. But so plaintiff's exhibit 34 is the, the full exhibit. And uh, it's in the record. His, his deposition testimony, which was admitted at trial, is in the record at clerk's record 643, I believe. Um, and so I think put in context, but fundamentally, it's an evidentiary issue. This was a week long bench trial in which the, uh, the court heard a lot of testimony about what we had and had not relied on. And even Mr. Sharpour testified repeatedly. And you can look at volume two of the reporter's record, pages 105 and 160. Uh, Mr. Sharpour testified repeatedly that he knew because Omnova had made him repeatedly aware that Omnova was relying on the information he was providing about the current state of the company's operations and sales. And so there was really no dispute about whether that information was relied upon. There is one question I have. Justice Christopher, if you don't mind, I have one more question. Thank you. So it, assuming that there is some uh, angst that uh, the court may have over the amount of damages in this case, an evaluation of those damages in relationship to the, the assets acquired and the purchase price paid. Would you like to address any of the concerns that, that we might have in that regard and maybe how uh, Tenasca Energy may actually impact on our decision? And, and I'm sorry, what, what was the case, Your Honor? Uh, Tenasca Energy, it's the uh, the unchallenged findings of fact. I, I've not considered um, that it's particular cited case. In your, cited in your brief, that's how. <laughs> uh, I've not considered how that may impact this issue. Frankly, Your Honor, I don't think that it's an issue on this appeal, the, the measure or the calculation of damages, because that's not something the appellants have really raised or briefed. Um, although, yes, they, they do say, hey, it's unfair, this is a big damages award. Of course, as your honors understand well, the, the size of the judgment, that includes, on the breach of contract, that includes attorney's fees and interest. And so, understood, the amount of the judgment is going to be um, high. I think that there was um, evidence that the value of the company in reality compared to the value as represented was a very large disparity. And there was evidence about a number of damages, um, kind of aspects or elements of damages. And so um, whether there may be an issue um, about some aspect of that, again, I don't think that's really been joined issue on this appeal. Um, but if it's something that the court is interested in us uh, assisting the court with, uh, be happy to submit a letter brief next week if that's something that the court's interested in and thinks has, uh, has been raised. I don't think that's necessary, but I was interested in your response, so thank you. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Your Honors. All right, we'll hear a rebuttal from Mr. Hill. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, hold on a sec. I had to click on Okay. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. As to Mrs. Sherpour, not only did she not testify at trial, there was no deposition, there was no documents whatsoever, other than that she signed the agreement as a shareholder and she was the president of one of the entities. However, in the disclosure statements, it clearly shows that there's only seven employees and she's not one of the employees. It is not unusual in a small family business of six or seven people uh, to have shares owned by your wife or by your husband, even though someone else is running the business. So there's just absolutely no evidence whatsoever 
uh, that she had anything to do with anything other than simply signing and being willing to uh, so, sell so it. If I, if, I, if I may, so what you're saying is, Andrea, that your, your position is she may be liable under contract, but not under fraud. Would that be your position? Well, she couldn't possibly be liable under fraud uh, because she never made a representation or met with anyone. As it relates to the breach of contract, uh, she in her individual capacity is far different than in the company. She signed the corporate documents conveying the shares. But if you look at the findings of fact, it says that she knew that they knowingly committed fraud or they knowingly breached the contract. How could they have done that when she didn't have, there's no evidence that she had any knowledge of anything other than signing the document itself. Uh, as it relates to uh, the reference uh, a few minutes ago by Novus Council, as it relates to these other provisions in the contract, each one of them, for example, 5.12 on financial statements ties to result in a seller material adverse effect, capitalized. So really this case is gonna turn on your interpretation of what does that mean? It's a defined term in an agreement by sophisticated lawyers. Uh, what does it mean? Does it mean what it says? What it says is the legal ability of the entity to do business. That's the definition. As it relates to these, uh, these the fact that seals went down, again, there's nothing in the, in the documents that show that the company, anything wrong with the company, the oil market plummeted. In exhibit 13 of plaintiffs, it shows sales forecast for Aramco and Baker Hughes, both of which they complain about here. What's the sales forecast? It says zero. How can there be big sales if you forecast and you disclose that it's zero? Look at the accounts receivable. That's schedule 5.24 of the APA, of the asset purchase agreement. It shows there's only $110,000 worth of sales in the whole month. It shows $72,000 of sales in a prior month. If they come to the trial court and say, oh, we thought it was going to be a half million dollar a month company. That's not what the financial records and the APA say. That's not what the disclosure statement says. And that's why their counsel, Ms. Rohrbeck, said there are no other purchase orders. That's it. So we ask you to reverse and remand uh, for attorney fees and, and reverse on the issue of $1.5 million we're owed as the balance due under the contract. I see I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for those arguments and the case is submitted and the court is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, your honors. Thank you.